Welcome everybody. Tuesday night. We're here on another great episode of the College I'm Deb Britt. Uh, as usual with me, uh, Terry the Tech God. We've got Chuck Wilson and Dave Jones made it back tonight. Welcome back, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a good episode tonight on ship repair with us, all out of Hampton Roads. We've got Ken Lang. He's the Vice President and General Manager with Auxiliary Systems, Inc. We've got uh, Nick. He's uh, He runs the machine shop. He's had 13 years, started from the bottom over there. John is the VP of Human Resources. He's been there for 18 years. And Brian's outside machine shop lead. He's been there for three years. He's done some other stuff before that. They're going to talk about what they've done, how they got there, the kind of classes, any kind of education they did. And... Um, going to be a great show. Everybody tuning in at home, uh, ship repair. We're, we're located here in Hampton Roads, so we've got plenty of ships to work on. Um, Ken, I'm just going to go straight from the stop, uh, stop with you because you are the vice president over there. Uh, real quick, how, how did you get into the ship repair industry? Well, it's interesting. I, um, I got a background in manufacturing, and probably 15 years ago, I met the owner of Church, uh, and he told me about his company and what he was doing. I thought he was either half crazy or he had a pretty good uh, deal going. So um, uh, about 10 years ago, he decided to diversify and get into some of the manufacturing side of things, which is my background. So I joined the company um, almost 10 years ago. Okay. That's great. Uh, real quick, Nick, same thing. Uh, what, what got you into this? Uh, I had a couple of friends working for the company. Uh, I used to work on the hovercrafts out at uh, one of the, naval bases beforehand and that just wasn't cutting it for me so they're like hey do you want to be a machinist and I came and applied and the guy that was running the shop at the time he's like are you good at math I was like, yeah i'm really good at math so he's like all right well do some math problems for me and did that and he goes all right you're hired <laughs> so now when we say math give me a, give me an example i mean is this like geometry i mean this is some uh, quick actually, percentages there's some, there's some advanced calculus that takes place in there. Uh, but like, I mean, I, I did all that throughout school. It was two math classes every year at least. But uh, yeah, I mean, most of it's easy geometry stuff, but then you do have the times where it is calculus and you have to find out all kinds of things. Easy for the guy that did not drop out of geometry class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you say math, when you say math to Jeff, he's talking like one plus one equals three. Hey, Dave, I'm really good at percentages, Dave. Really good. Markup. You're good at markup. <laughs> uh, John, here's the six dollars. Uh, introduce yourself, John. Tell us about a little bit about yourself. So, I uh, joined the Navy in 1998. Um, I was an engineman. Um, when I was in, I was an evaporator technician. I spent most of my time working on evaporators. So, of course, the obvious answer was to go with the uh, ship repair company that specializes in evaporators. So I found Auxiliary Systems, um, went on board with them and started through their apprenticeship program. Um, later, I uh, went on to get my degree while I was there. So I started off there as a technician and worked my way up through the ranks. For those at home, real quick, can you tell us uh, what the evaporators do on the boat? Sure. Uh, it's, it's essentially uh, uh, one of the most critical pieces of equipment on board a ship. It, it turns uh, salt water into fresh water. Easy so it's, it's essentially a desalinator. Okay. And we got one more, Brian. Where are you at, Brian? Yes, talk, talk to us. How'd you get into this? Uh, right out of high school, a buddy of mine's girlfriend's uncle started a company called 264 Construction. All we did was birthing areas. So I started on sheet metal there. That company ended up going under. So I transferred over to one of the big companies. And I had never done ventilation before, but this, that's what sheet metal shop does. Found out the hard way. So after being there for a good seven, eight years, I realized I hated insulation. So I wanted no parts of sheet metal, no more. But uh, stepped away from that and swore I'd never come back in the shipyards. But I started my own uh, construction company, and then that fell through after about five years. And my buddy Keith Pugh used to work here, and we had always grown up turning wrenches together. And he just knew I'd be a good fit for the job. I had never done outside machine work, but 
once I got into it, I realized I was made for it. <laughs> Looking I back, is it something uh, maybe, you know, if you would have found out, had this op opportunity, you know, coming fresh out of high school or something, is that something uh, hindsight Absolutely. being 2020 where you'd be now, right? Much less <laughs> miserable. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Dave, you haven't been out here in a while. How about how about uh, enlightening us with some some of your uh, wise wisdom, Dave? What you got for these guys? Well, I got a question. First yeah. of all, it's deep thought. <laughs> hey, it's story time with Dave Jones. Story time. <laughs> anyway. He just missed you, Dave. Let's break this thing down, yeah. first of all, for the people that are listening out there. Uh, the last guy, I didn't catch his name. The last guy that's an outside machinist. Brian. Brian, Brian. I'm sorry. Yeah, no we changed up our, we've changed up our format here, and I can't see the names like I used to be able to. What, when you say outside machinist, tell us what you mean. Uh, you basically install, uninstall pumps, motors, do laser alignments on shafts, uh, align sheaves on pumps. You know, we got tension gauges. We got to get that all specific. Uh, we clean and rebuild coolers, heaters, condensers, and the size of your living room. So thousands of tubes in them. We've got to go through every tube, clean them out. But more or less, in a sense, we're parts changers. <laughs> Okay, okay. So you're making, you're taking older stuff that's got some age on it. And you're making it new, really, right? That or swapping it out for new? Yes, sir. Do it, do it one or the other, and and uh, yep. That's pretty interesting. So you're like punching tubes and doing all that kind of stuff on these heat exchangers. Bingo. It sounds like, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I punched a few tubes too myself. Um, Ken, I got a question for you. When you said you got into manufacturing, what were they manufacturing? Yeah, so we, uh, we've got three of our own brands of products. We do sound attenuated enclosures, uh, the UL, UL fuel tank that goes with it. And also we take a more or less a shipping container. We can upfit it with whatever, whatever piece of equipment you'd want. Uh, we've done tool rooms for Navy SEAL dive teams. We've done uh, paper shredder for the government, uh, Northeast Annex of the White House. We won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> Hmm. We uh, we also have what we call contracted products. So we make somebody else's intellectual property. They give us their drawings and we manufacture the product for their drawings. So we've pretty much diversified. And, um, you know, the owner, Rick Williams and his wife, you know, he's got a big vision. And the Navy, you know, they don't plan very well. So their budgets are up and down. And his thought process was when the ship repair work was slow, that we could fill in the gaps by manufacturing. And that's been a pretty good strategy. It's kept our workforce pretty stable. So it's kind of the same skills to manufacture. You can cross train people that can outfit these containers or whatever that we're doing the ship fitting work. That's correct. Yeah, we've uh, we've gotten bigger now. So we've specialized. So we have a, um, you know, a dedicated manufacturing team. Uh, but all those folks can also transition to the ship repair if you ever need that. Now, do all you guys know each other? They're, they're on here? Absolutely. We do, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we do very well. all you guys are in the same realm, in the same, in the same deal there, but just different jobs, right? That's correct. How about, hey, Chuck? Yes, Dave. Your mouth started to move. It looked like you wanted to ask a question. Well, this is an exciting show for me because I had a. T it's deep thoughts with Chuck Wilson. <laughs> it always takes me a moment to recover from that. Uh <laughs> hey, Chuck, Chuck, just know this. I haven't forgot what you text me this week. All right. Good. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> anyway, this is an exciting show for me because I had a 22-year career in the U.S. Navy and spent most of my time, at, uh, over 11 years of sea time, uh, in engineering, uh, including a tour as a chief engineer of uh, uh, a ship out of uh, Long Beach, California, back when Long Beach was 
still a Navy uh, port. But uh, all the, the talk about evaporators, which I remember as a uh, engineering officer of the watch having to draw the uh, diagram of how seawater is turned into uh, potable or drinkable water on a ship, which, yes, that you don't last very long if you can't make water out there uh, at sea. Uh, anyway, uh, just uh, lots of uh, great stuff to talk about. And uh, what a, it, it's, it's a great nexus, I would use that term, uh, at the shipyard as far as trades. Every trade that I can think of is represented in a shipyard. And it's, it's in what you guys do, what, what you take on uh, is so much more, or you have to do what everybody is doing ashore, you know, for shore facilities, but it also has to go out on the water. So it's uh, much more challenging. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, pass it first to John and and ask, uh, where did you pick up your passion for uh, doing what you're doing? Uh, well, we're talking about uh, fixing evaporators or human resources. Well, mainly <laughs> evaporators, I'm thinking, but uh, yeah, the whole the whole thing. It's interesting, you know, when when I was in. Um, I had a first class that was an expert that, that loved to teach. Uh, and he happened to, that was his expertise. And he uh, took me under his wing. And I think um, uh, it kind of trickled down and I, I sort of developed the same passion for the equipment. And uh, it, it kind of carried me through and started my career. Well, it's, it's just not, not easy equipment to work. I mean, it's uh, a little bit finicky, right? It is. I mean, that's what's sort of enjoyable about a flash type evaporators because it, you know, it's not just some gears and, you know, if you have a, a, a seal or a bearing go bad, it, it, you know, it crumbles and falls apart. It's, you've got all these different components from steam, potable water, condensate that work together at proper temperatures. And if the chemistry is not right, you're not making water. So you've got to sort of finesse it into, into making good potable water. Yep. One of my favorite sea stories or uh, memories from way back when uh, involved having to fix the, uh, the, the entire steam system so that we could make water. Uh, so let me see, uh, it's uh, Nick, uh, it, it's yes. not talking about uh, evaporators with you, but uh, what is it that uh, brings passion to what you're doing out there? Well, passion, uh, it started out when I was working on the LCAX out at ACU Corps, which is the uh, Little Creek. Which Bay. is landing craft air cushioned. Is, uh... uh Hands-on stuff really got me going. Uh, I've loved it ever since I was a kid, really, working on anything, turning wrenches. Uh, what I did not like was the heat inside of an LCAC. So when I got the opportunity to become an inside machinist, I hopped on that and pretty much ran with it. I mean, some of the stuff that I get to make is awesome. Uh, it's just like taking a piece of metal and turning it into really whatever I want. So taking that uh, vision and realizing the, uh, making it real, right? Yeah. How about uh, uh, Brian, where's your passion and what you're doing? I've, I've just all, I feel like I got the same story as Nick. I've always loved turning wrenches. I was the guy running around the street on trash day, picking up VCRs and TVs just to see if I could fix them. So I've always <laughs> how many, how many did works. you get going, bud? A lot, man, a lot. Yeah. Have you yeah. seen pictures of my yard? I still have that bad habit. <laughs> <laughs> I, <stuff> <laughs> yeah, I can't pull my camera down because my house looks like my yard. <laughs> pull the VCR parts on the floor? Is that what it is? No, no, I moved on to bigger and better things with motors, things that go vroom now. Got a backyard full of four wheelers and dirt bikes. Not giving out my address. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, come back to Ken, my my great friend, and uh, uh, just ask. You were in manufacturing previously, and uh, 
moving out into ship repair, you you may have met some a different uh, type of folk out there. What what's the what do you think drives these people? What have you learned about uh, ship repair type trades? Well, these these folks are highly driven, Chuck. Uh, you know, it's a patriotic duty. What we do, we're essential personnel. Um, you know, we we help the warfighter. Um, without our trades, without our folks, you know, the ship won't get out to sea. Uh, especially in what's happening in the world today, you know, um, the availabilities are a lot shorter because they can't take the ships out of service as long. And, so, and explain what an availability is. So availability is when a ship uh, needs maintenance, they schedule availability. And what that means is that's a time frame, usually 90 days for what we do uh, as a prime contractor. And you have items, which is uh, work packages, and you have to complete those items within that time frame. And um, there is no, uh, occasionally you get uh, an extension, but uh, that's, uh, that's difficult. So you finish your work package by the time the date has come for the ship to leave. Is the ship in the water when you're doing this or out of the water or what? Uh, it depends where we're working. We, uh, when we're working CMAS as a prime, the ship is in the water, usually at NOB. Uh, but here at the yards locally, NASCO, uh, BAE, uh, MHI, they do have dry docks. Uh, so uh, the ship is out of the water. And those availabilities are a little bit longer. A little bit different scenario. It depends on the type of work that's being done. Okay. Uh, and Ken, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, outreach that you're doing, looking for uh, trades folks to come in to to the uh, ship repair. Yeah. So several years ago, again, uh, Rick Williams, our owner, you know, has a big vision, and um, you know, the Navy stopped teaching. Uh, their personnel how to fix things back five, 10 years ago. Hmm. And that became a challenge. So there wasn't the trade skill coming out of the Navy like when John came out. Uh, so we have to train our own folks. And we decided we're gonna start at the high schools. So every year we, uh, except the last, <laughs> uh, we didn't do anything in the spring because everything was shut down. But uh, John, myself, um, another one of John's assistants, we go to high schools, we put a presentation on exactly what you guys talk about, how there's a different path to success, how you can, um, you know, learn a trade skill, get a good paying job with good benefits. And if you want to go to college, you can still do that, but you can pay for it and not be in debt. And, what, uh, what's your reception that you received to that and how many schools do you get a hit in the area? So we've, uh, we've ramped up. I think last year we probably did um, all the Southampton Roads high schools from Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, Suffolk, Portsmouth, Norfolk. Um, do it in the spring and also in the uh, in the in the, uh, in the fall. And we also meet with the parents. Yeah, you know, it's one thing to get the student excited, but a lot of times the harder sale is the parents. And we usually bring them in afterwards after we present it to their child and talk about the same things we're talking about today. How there's a different path, what the success can be. Um, and John can attest, I mean, we've had parents come up and hug us after the presentations. And, and John, actually, I wanted to ask you, being human resources, which jobs are you having the most hard time filling right now? Um, you know, we have some positions that are pretty unique uh, for, uh, I'll say, you know, motor rewinder for one. So the Navy stopped training motor rewinders you know, 20 years ago. So it's it's hard to find someone off the shelf that has that background. Uh, so a lot of times when we are lucky enough to find someone, you know, they've, you know, they're, they're late 50s, uh, early 60s. So, you know, we, we, we struggle with, you know, finding, you know, some, a lot of folks in that, in that arena without making them ourselves. What, what would you guesstimate a motor rewinder would make, John? Just a ballpark starting, ending, something like that. Um, I, I, you know, it, it, on average, I would say between 25 and $35 an hour. Okay. And they're basically for a motor, they're just sitting at a, at a table, rewinding motors all day, right? Just. Well, no, it's a little more technical than that. I mean, well, it's a correct, but I mean, they're not necessarily like, are, are they, are they actually like in the boats or is most of that stuff come back? 
It's it's mainly shop work, refurbish work right. in the shop. Yeah, in yeah. the shop. Mm-hmm. Nice fan blowing on them. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't say <laughs> that. Our motor wanders have air conditioning. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, a little more of a cush job than than being down in below deck, I would imagine. Certainly. Okay. Any other any other jobs y'all having a hard time filling right now? Um, you know, we, we have our, our unique um jobs like motor rewinder that that are, of course are always a little more difficult to find than say just a, a marine electrician uh, where you know you've got the shipyards that have the train through apprenticeship programs and and uh, various training um, finding finding those folks on the shelves uh, but usually uh, let's say evaporator techs I mean we're the best evaporator techs on the east coast so if we want evaporator techs we have to make them ourselves fair enough what about safety out there? What about safety with all these different jobs? How big a thing is safety? Somebody got a lot of stuff going on out there. You know, we, we, we talk about safety every day. We can't emphasize enough to our folks, uh, you know, how, how important it is. I mean, the shipyard is, is probably one of the most dangerous places to work. Uh, you can't, you can't lose focus when you're, when you're doing that type of work. Uh, so, so certainly we take it serious. And now with, you know, COVID, of course, we've got, a new challenge that we're all trying to figure out and you know osha's now you know chiming in on how we do that so it's certainly um you know on the top of our list of things we need to make sure we focus on on a daily basis yeah i would think you've got with those compressed work schedules you have a lot of stuff going on simultaneously out there like a lot of different trades working with each other and and, and probably a lot of um a lot of um safety plans you got to submit beforehand maybe burn permits maybe all sorts of stuff you got cranes going with motors i can just imagine what somebody's got to be working orchestrate this whole thing it is there, there's there's quite a bit of red tape involved in, in what we do uh but you know it, it's part of the process it's it's how we we you know keep ourselves safe um and just watch each other's backs every day what what would some of the less technical jobs over there be? Would you say like somebody with this maybe doesn't have the wrench turning skills that Brian's had or Nick, uh, you know, in their past, and they want to come in and maybe not quite the wrench turner? What kind of non technical jobs can they jump right into? So we uh, we've done a few things with this. We we have a, a sort of a summer internship we do. Uh, usually it's for folks that are maybe in their junior year or senior year uh, in transition, where they come into workforce over the summer. You know, they're under the age of 18, so there are certain things they can't do as far as rotating machinery. But we let them get involved in, you know, uh, maybe tearing apart a motor, teaching them, you know, sort of the basics, uh, sort of in a helper type status. And, of course, fire watches is another one that's sort of entry level to uh, to the shipyard in general, where, uh, you know, it's not not real technical. You come in, you, you, you know, you get some training, and your, your job is to make sure the welder doesn't catch himself or the ship on fire. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, from there, you know, folks either move up or move out. Right. And what kind of, I mean, just a base kind of, uh, pay scale for, for somebody like that. So generally we, we don't bring anybody in under $12 an hour. Uh, so I'd say that's probably our base level. Uh, so our helpers normally run anywhere from 12 to $15 an hour before they move into that third class trade status. All right. And and, uh, we got a question coming in. Uh, But before we get to that, I wanted to ask Nick. So, Nick, when you say you're a machinist, uh, tell everyone exactly what all you do being a machinist besides all that crazy math. So most (laughs) of what we do is electric motor repair and pump repair. So uh, the electricians, they'll bring a motor off of the boat. uh, They'll tear it apart. We do initial readings on that motor. Uh, If the readings are bad uh, for the embells, the shafts, or the pump itself, uh, we can either sleeve the embell or make an entire new shaft for the motor. Uh, it really depends on what needs to be done, but I mean, everything is done in house. Uh, we do, we make coolers uh, for the sonar skids, radar skids. We're actually making one of those right now. Uh, so basically, what we'll have is a large sheet of copper nickel material that has upwards of 400 holes put into it. Uh, that's all done usually on a CNC machine, but it's all programming that our guys do in-house. And what, what's the 
the scale of the size of motors you're doing. I mean, I'm sure you're, you uh, know. Anything from two horsepower to 150 horsepower, I believe. So small to need a crane to pick it up. Yeah, 150 is a big boy. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Brian, real quick, uh, what kind of exact, when you, cause you say you're an outside machinist. So we're, where Brian's more of an inside, I'm sorry, where John, uh, Nick's more of an inside is what kind of work exactly are you doing, uh, on the outside? Uh, we don't do quite the technical stuff that Nick has to deal with. Man. He's all precision to where, I mean, yes, there is some precision to our jobs, but we more or less, I guess you say either renew or install new stuff, but uh, ships, um, except laser alignments on shafts, uh, lining some motors, checking tension on belts, um, I'm pretty much unbolting and bolting a lot of stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. It sounds like a lot of kind of preventive maintenance on on y'all's on the outside size, right? Yeah. I mean, we check tolerances and stuff, and make sure they're still within spec and whatnot. But other than that, Nick Nick deals with all the brain stuff. Okay. Right. <laughs> Chuck, I'm sorry, Dave. Well, you're writing down something, no? Yeah, I was just making a note because yeah, go ahead. Everybody, everybody. This, this word machinist is used so widely with this the difference between one or one or the other when you when you work on these ships are you guys actually taking like are you when you talk about motors I think like in Jeb and my world we're talking about little motors you guys are talking about how big are these motors he, he said 150 what do you say we got he said 150 150 can be anywhere from 500 pounds to Thousands of pounds, depending on what yeah. pump or motor we're talking about. You know, some of the larger shafts that we work on are 60 inches long and weigh a couple thousand pounds. Gosh, that's crazy. And that's just a shaft. Do shaft too? <laughs> Say what? Do divers have to get involved with this too? Like, does somebody have to dive ever to help no. with this? Or Not usually. Not usually. It's all inside the, the motor rooms or whatever. Do you have to crane these things out? Yes. Sometimes Certain you have to stuff cut holes definitely. In, a boat in order to get them out. And even cut holes in the side of the ship sometimes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So divers yeah. get involved when we're doing that. Um, we just did some work on USS Laboon that required a coffer dam. We were welding below the waterline of the ship. And uh, obviously, if we punch a hole through the side of the ship, it's going to take on water, so they the Navy requires what's called a coffer dam. So they send divers to the, into the water and put up a structure around the outside of the ship where you're welding on the inside. Uh, creates like a bubble, so that in case you puncture through the hull of the ship, obviously there's no water going to get in. So that's a requirement. Uh, so you know it's a team effort. And we had a couple of those Navy divers on our show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, they're they're real. They're interesting folks. Yeah. And, and and like your trade, probably do you have a do you have a lot of um do you have a lot of women in your trade? We, we have more and more. Uh, we uh, we find that uh, especially in the welding field, uh, women do really well. Uh, in fact, some of the best welders are women. Absolutely. I think you probably I mean, heard they, they pay a little bit more attention to detail than the men do. Uh, they, they can. Um, they're just uh, very diligent. Um, we just hired one here recently from San Diego, and, and she's probably one of the best welders we've met. Um, we're doing a five triple X, which is a specialized aluminum that requires uh, quite quite skill, a lot of skill. And um, in fact, we've got her sort of running the procedure to get approved to be able to even do this welding. So. We're real there's excited about that. There's nothing holding women back from being able to do this job. No, and, and and John can speak more. I mean, they're across all our trades. We've got some women outside machinists. Uh, we don't have anything in Nick's uh, area yet, but uh, we could. Uh, but they're they're well. Uh, they're they're easily cross trained, and uh, I like to say they're they're hard workers and and, and highly skilled. Is this a is this an eight to five job or is it three shifts a day? I mean, what's what's the hours for something like this? Because it seems like you have a compressed schedule. 
to get stuff done. Yeah, I'm on our normal working hours is 6.30 to 3.30, but um, I think our earliest guy gets here at 4.30. He runs our electric shop. Oh. And uh, I see him when I leave, you know, 6, 6.30 at night, he's still here. Oh, wow. And he runs one of our biggest shops. Uh, but our average hours are 6.30, 3.30. There is a, overtime, and uh, that's based on need, based on the type of job we're doing. And we could run five, 600 hours a week in overtime over our, our whole workforce. So uh, we've got a question asking, uh, what makes the industry rewarding for you and for those who may want to get involved? Um, Nick, you're at the top. It's your question, bud. What makes it rewarding for me? Well, the pay is great. Uh, can't argue about that at all. <laughs> Uh, it's guaranteed work. It's government work. So you know there's going to be work. Uh, and when everything shut down with COVID, uh, we were classified as essential. So we were still able to make money. Great. And you're making money doing something you like to do, right? That's I mean that's the key. That's the whole that's the whole thing. All right. What's what's the most reward? I mean, where do you receive your? Yeah, that. The mental or you know psychological reward besides the pay. Oh, when you see the final product finished, like ready to ship out, because uh, we deal with things that are in tens of thousands of an inch, so four decimal places. You take a sheet of paper and you split it into ten pieces. We deal with something that's one thickness of that, I guess. Uh, so when you're dealing with tolerances that tight. And you see it go out the door, it's great. Hmm. Awesome. Well, and, and Nick, I just want to stop one second and you know, do a little sideline uh, with you because I have heard so many people say, well, all that math that I went through in high school, I never had any use for. You <laughs> see it on the internet, on Facebook. All, all this wasted time in math. What do you say to those folks? I use math every single day. Every single day. Awesome. I took, I took advanced calculus throughout high school, so give us say, I'm, give I'm us, even using some of that. Nick, Nick, give us an example of how you would use math in your job. I'm curious. All right, so there's uh, a lot of times I have to find a radius of anything, really. Um, I'm not giving an entire circle. Uh, I'm just more geometry. But uh, given a couple points and the depth of a curve, I'm able to find just the radius so I can set that into a new part. Uh, a lot of times we, are, we aren't given a print in order to make something. So we're making it as a first sample. So we have to do a lot of measuring and uh, figure out the math for the radius or anything really. Well, and you, you have to know the tolerances of the, the, the materials that you're using and their breaking points and factor all that in. No, and not, not so much your breaking point, but tolerances and material. Yeah, we have to know pretty much everything about it. Okay. That's very, very specialized. I love it. Do y'all do any submarines? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I haven't done too much submarine. We do motors a lot for submarines, and those are a nightmare. Tolerances. Uh, it's two ten thousandths of an inch run out allowable on a shaft that we do. And that's so small you can't even see it. Well, yeah, the sound uh, uh, requirements on a submarine and the nuclear power aspects of it. I mean, everything is uh, much can't, tighter. Can't, can't without getting too super top secret. What I mean, y'all are doing a little bit of work on subs. He, he, yeah, we, we work for uh, some of the companies that, that um, put equipment on subs. So we, you know, that requires a special clearance. And, um, you know, we've got a, we've got a, uh, a higher security clearance and uh, requires, that's required to work on a submarine. And uh, that's one of our goals. Our objectives is to do more work. Uh, that's, a, that's a new market for us. Right now we're touching equipment that goes on a submarine. So as Nick says, it's very precise. Uh, there's a lot of quality control involved. Um, some of that specialized metal like titanium. 
So we do work for one company that does titanium systems that go on submarines. So it's very specialized. That's cool. Brian, have you got it going any ship, any subs yet? No, I've been not yet. any subs personally. Okay. No, I think they keep all that on naval bases. I'm 90% at BAE. Okay. So that's the last move to like uh, container ships and such. Well, let's take the, uh, the last question to, uh, to Brian there. Yeah, uh, the Which BAE. Question? So that was that's mostly like container ships and and stuff like that. Cargo. Oh no, it's, it's naval vessels, but they don't have submarines there. Not, okay. What does BAE mean? What's that mean? It's, the, it's a ship is one of our yeah. shipyards. Yeah. What's that? BAE is one of our shipyards here locally. Okay. Right. Uh, it's the old North Shipco. They were okay. purchased by BAE. Okay. All right, and. Um, Sorry. So let's get back to um, money because, you know, back to our podcast, blue pop, you know, blue collar green pockets. We do like to make sure everyone knows the what what's out there. You know, if they're if they're looking into a shipyard, they don't want to go to college right off the bat, which I know, John, you were telling us earlier, you got a good story how you ended up going to college through your GI Bill and what the shipyard helped you with. Um, what kind of money, I mean, really can they top out? I mean, like you said, you started working on evaporators. Now you're HR resources. So give us kind of a, a good sentiment on, on, on a say, six figures a year. Is that, is that, is that achievable at the shipyard with hard work and overtime? It, it certainly is. Uh, that's, that's an achievable goal. Uh, now, that's not a next year achievable goal, but it's certainly, you know, uh, you know, somewhere where you could work your way up to in, you know, 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, is a reasonable goal. Uh, but I've, I've seen it uh, so many times where there's, there's certainly folks out there that did not have a degree that came in that were uh, dedicated to their trade that moved up to the ranks and make more than someone with even their doctorate degree. Right. So you can do extremely well, just, just picking a trade and specializing in it. What are the, uh, are there any key characteristics of these folks that go into those six figure areas or do, you know, really excel at their job and move up the ranks pretty quick? Are there key characteristics that you've noticed to these people that you could tell people to focus on that are interested in not only this career, but any careers in blue collar or just careers in general? Certainly. Um, you know, it's not just uh, primarily the trade. You know, the trade is, is half of it. The other part is, you know, being part of a common goal and knowing what the objective is, you know, asking yourself what is in the best interest of the company and, and you know, uh, you know, being proactive, uh, you know, trying to, to eliminate as many problems as you can as far as your uh, normal work day, just doing good quality work, uh, looking out for your comrades and uh, uh, just uh, uh, being a good employee. That's it. That's pretty much any job there, right? That's it. Okay, right. can't go ahead, hey, sir. I'm oh, sorry. Hey, Nick. Yes. What's the biggest nightmare you ever had? I mean, you had to have had a nightmare job. I was going to start out with the coolest job list. and then get to that. Uh, <laughs> the biggest nightmare like like you know like oh my god did i just do that <laughs> oh I, I put the wrong number of holes think... in the flange one time on a rush job hey he's got human resources here should he be yeah. answering this right now i put the wrong number of holes in the flange one time it's supposed to be a 12 volt flange and i put 14 holes in it uh, mm. and that was a that was a big mess up that was a titanium flange as well Oh, oh, oh. Not, now, not too happy about that one. Did, did you realize that, or did somebody else realize that? Uh, I realized it after the production manager was showing me the old flange and <laughs> saw that it was a 12 volt flange. You were like, oh, shit. yeah. <laughs> uh, did you have to redo it, or did you just buy oh, go? Yeah. Uh, we just ordered, buy two more bolts. We ordered another piece of material, and I had it done the next day. Oh boy! Yeah. So how how many uh how many years did the ribbing for that mistake last? Uh, that happened like three years ago. Uh, I don't really mess up too much, so they were easy on me. Uh, 
probably last like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we got lucky. <laughs> So how many of y'all, I know John said he did, um, have a military background before you got into this? I mean, any kind of military, two, four years, whatever. Not, not just, for me. Just John, okay. Not for me. And, and uh, it's disappointing to hear that the Navy isn't teaching folks how to uh, actually work as technicians in this arena anymore. Is that, I mean, is that really the case, John? It is. I mean, they're they're teaching them to do the basic PMS, you know, follow the PMS cards, you know, uh, you know, change the oil, do the basic maintenance. But as far as being able to troubleshoot, tear something apart and put it back together again, the general typical sailor can't can't do that. Hmm. Now, is that is that due to just rollover of people changing career fields within the military and staying in for four years? So you you never really have that person that masters it and then stays there or? I think uh, I think there's a lot of factors that play into that. I think that the, the Navy's got relying on shipyards doing that stuff. So I don't think they spend all, as much time uh, as they as they used to. They're starting to identify that and starting to identify new ways of training the sailors. And we've sort of been monitoring that and seeing how we can get involved in that. Um, but it's certainly a topic that they're uh, uh, a concern that they're aware of that they're trying to uh, to address now. Well, th this seems like a un, um, unexpected side effect of a decision where uh, the, Na the Navy said, oh, we'll use the shipyards to fix these things that normally or sailors would have been involved in in the past. Now, it's like the shipyards or the uh, uh, the companies like yours who uh, are doing these repairs are going, well, we can't find the people that can do the repairs. So and it's. And I would say a lot of turnover too, probably Chuck, you know, where they're not they're only staying there for is by the time you can teach them anything, they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. It has a lot to do with the budgets. You know, when the budgets are uh, low, <clears throat> you know, shipyards lay off and, we always talk when we lay somebody off, they're, they're gone. They're probably not coming back. So we try to, we're the opposite. We try to hold on to our people. And, and sometimes, you know, that doesn't go well with the financial stakeholders, if you will, because uh, it could be about the bottom line for them. But for us, it's retaining good talent. And um, so we try to retain as many of our folks as we can, even if there's a downturn. And it's hard to find the good ones. It is. It's hard to find the good ones. And, and we, uh, we we do a really good job. John and his team do a really good job of, of keeping those folks on, on staff. Well, a question for John, and this um, something I've noticed, especially uh, getting to know more and more blue collar um, folks as this podcast has gone on. And I've talked to other folks uh, about this podcast is there's a certain unique level of pride that blue collar has that I don't experience since I basically work in the white collar industry. Um, but there's a certain level of pride and there's a certain level of camaraderie that seems to be pretty unique to the blue collar industry and, and, and the way that it's, they kind of come together and everybody helps each other out and has each other's back. Um, it, it seems to be unique and there's not that, you know, you hear the uh, the stereotypical uh, cube farm dramas and stuff, and I, I just I I don't hear that really from the blue collar industry. Is that is that true, or is you know what what are your thoughts on that, John? There, there's definitely some truth to that, but certainly we're not absence of drama. We certainly have our share of that. <laughs> don't get me wrong. So we all. But there is a camaraderie. I think uh, there is, especially in the shipyard world. Uh, you know, we're all collectively a family. Um, you know, we all support the Department of Defense. And I think there's a, a, a good amount of pride that goes into that, knowing that, uh, you, you know, defense relies on us to be able to make sure that these ships can get underway and, and defend our country. So um, there is that, that that camaraderie there, I, th I think, across the board. Is it all done? Is it all done there at the shipyard where you are or is it um, is it a. Uh, 
ever done remotely, like under emergency circumstances or anything like that? Um, there are. I mean, we, uh, you know, as far as Ken was talking about the availability. So, you know, ships have routine availabilities where they'll pull in, you know, every every year and a half or so for, you know, uh, you know, overhauling certain equipment that's due for maintenance. Uh, but certainly the Navy can CAS rep a, a piece of equipment while they're out at sea. Um, send us Ex out on a helicopter to, to, to fix the equipment. Explain CAS rep. So it's emergency repair that they don't know how to fix. So they reach out to the contractors that do and uh, send them out. So, you know, we, we've sent some folks out to sea. We've sent some folks overseas to do a, a repair, whether it be, um, uh, you know, a specialized piece of equipment or a motor or something that effect, even if it's just to put a Band-Aid on it until we can get them into port. Um, uh, you know, we, we do that from time to time. Wow, that's interesting. That is cool. Really, you must be really organized to have that kind of mobilization, I would think. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, I, um, yeah, it's the ultimate team sport, I think, ship repair. I mean, uh, if you had any type of sports background, especially I played football back in the day, and, and that's the ultimate team sport, if you will. But it's very similar. You know, it, it takes everybody uh, turning the wrench in the same direction, if you will. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, a real sense of pride that everybody gets when a job's completed. Uh, an example, you know, we had a um, availability on the uh, the Comfort, which is the, uh, you know, the hospital ship that went to New York. Well, our guys were probably the last ones off before it left to go up to New York uh, several months ago. And, um, you yeah, know, we finished that availability ahead of time. Uh, I can tell you there was a lot of pride in, in working on that ship. And uh, that's that's just the kind of stuff we do on a day to day basis. So uh, it really lends itself well to working as a team. Yeah, Chuck's become quite the shuffleboard player down in Florida these days. Uh, not quite <laughs> football, but <laughs> or yeah. Dave, Dave, sorry. So I do have one uh, good question. So we're getting close to the time. I just want to make sure that everybody home, if they're watching this, they're seeing what all your machinist guys do in house, out of house. Right now, say they're interested, right? How do they reach out and find out their different career paths and opportunities with um, Auxiliary Systems, Inc.? So I would uh, encourage folks to, to go to our website. We have a career link there where we have all of our active open job listings, uh, as well as just a general application of employment. So although we may not be posting for a specific position, they can still apply, whether they're uh, regardless of the position, whatever the trade skill uh, they can they can apply, you know, and if it, we're not actively looking for it right now, that doesn't mean we won't be tomorrow. So I would encourage people to go to our website and, and apply there. What's that website again? I'll share it up here. Yeah, we'll put so it on our. So it's www.oxisinc.com, and that's A-U-X-S-Y-S-I-N-C.com. Excellent. I want to make sure we got that in before we run out of time tonight. We still got 10 minutes though. You got that up, Tech? Yeah. All right, there it is. So All if right. these folks want to, they want to get into this, um, maybe they're, say, a freshman in high school, and they've, they've only got a little bit of time before really being able to get into this career. Their, their websites to go to are their resources that they can read or listen to. I, I mean, it's amazing to see all these podcasts that show you how to do things. I mean, when I'm working on my cars that I, I go on YouTube and I watch these people do it and then I go out and do it and I'll be in a Facebook group and I'll say, I screwed this up. Um, what did I do wrong? And then you have a bunch of experts that are tell you. So are there, what are the resources, especially now in today's tech age that they can start to hone their skills and kind of put themselves ahead of the pack, so to speak. Like a Votech. Yeah, if they, if you know, you got Votech, but what if they don't have those options? Not everywhere has that option. So we have uh, an apprenticeship program that we, uh, uh, and this is through TCC and uh, recognized through the Department of Labor, where uh, you know you could go through the program, you could get you know credits going towards a degree. Uh, I believe it's towards an Associates of Applied Science degree and you come out with a journeyman in the trade that you're working in. 
So we, uh, um, you know, we've had some success with that. All of the folks that we've had that went through the program, that graduated the program, you know, finished the program strong, making, you know, probably seven to ten dollars more an hour than when they started, and they were all generally in management positions by the time they finished the program. That's nice. I, I want to ask. Uh, uh, I'll go with. Nick, first, I mean, what are you saying to your friends out there when you're you know, having a little gathering, uh, watch uh, if there were any sports on? Let's start with that. And I'll remind folks that this is being recorded during the COVID uh, deal. But uh, what do you say to your friends that are maybe not really happy in their careers? What, what advice are you giving them? I'm, I'm telling them to try something else. I mean, if you're not happy in what you're doing, it's no point in staying there at all. Uh, it's not going to get better. So if you're in a position to try something else, you should. Uh, most of my friends are, actually most of my friends work with me. But uh, so the ones that don't work with me are, I mean, pretty happy. But if they're not happy in the, the career path that they've chosen, I mean, there's always opportunities elsewhere. Uh, like we have a pretty big company and we're always hiring outside machinists. Some always looking for inside machinists because we're hard to come by. But uh, what's a, what's Nick? What's an inside machinist versus so an out? Inside machinists, we stay in the shop. We run lathes, mills, CNC machines. The outside guys are out on the boat. Okay. Doing wrench turning and other stuff. So, um, we got and a so, comment. I want uh, it. Uh, let me just move real quick to uh, Brian. What are you telling uh, your friends at your maybe little gatherings or that you're out uh, uh, hanging with uh, that aren't happy? Well, most of them at this age, they're either set in their ways or I wouldn't bother hiring them because they can't wake up for work. So you don't really talk too much. <laughs> you, have a, you have a lot of that you deal with nowadays, just getting people to show up. I mean, that, that seems to be the hardest part nowadays. But, uh, yeah, most of them are making good money or just not worth talking to about jobs. <laughs> well, that's very uh, informative, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You must be. I would say you must be present to win. You must yep. be present to win. Amen. But you are. You know, roll, if you don't roll out of bed in the morning and <clears throat> look, you're not. You're not gonna love your job every day, but you damn well better Absolutely like not. it. You better like it every day. You may not love it every single day, but you gotta. You gotta like it, and you have to be able to. You have to have a reason to get up in the morning. It sounds to me like like. Yep. I think Nick really, I think that's what Nick was saying earlier. All you guys have been saying the same thing. You got a reason to get up in the morning and go to work, right? Hey, Six of them running around downstairs. Well, well you got this comment here that says, you know, auxiliary systems saved my life. I don't know a was, better way to push your business than that. I mean, Vaughn, does Vaughn work there? Apparently. Yeah. Are you, yeah. He is. He is an employee. Okay. I didn't know whether he, he was on a, for me. or something and you guys saved him or. What the comment was about? Are you gonna stop his boat from sinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, my, my thought is just you know getting into uh, the blue collar industry, making good money, willing to probably take care of his family. You know, a lot of times you have in this blue collar industry, some folks are kind of treated like second class citizens, and uh, but blue collar is a huge lucrative career that people can find really rewarding, and. Uh, so it's something that you know probably means at least from my experience means a heck of a lot to people and really puts them on the right path because you know working hard and being able to see the reward of your labors you know you can't you can't put a price on that amen finished it, products it sounds to me like this one single company has a lot of different avenues you could take within it as far as different different skills that's absolutely right, Dave. It's 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 a diverse company, and uh, you know one of the beauties we have is that um, say you come in as an outside machinist and you show some uh, work ethic, you show some drive, and you want to go into another trade, 
you know, we move people around all the time. And we always tell folks, the more you know, the more valuable you are. Sure. Um, so we can plug you in somewhere else because, you know, one day we're working on an evaporator, the next day we, you know, we're welding on the deck of a ship. So uh, the more diverse everybody is, the better, better it is for them. And certainly the more value it offers us. Mm -hmm. okay, good. Any, uh, we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Is there any other thing you want to reach out to anybody that right now is watching that you might, you might've sparked an interest, any, anything at all, bring them along. Well, I think you know, I'll step in there. We, um, we're a growing company. We've doubled in size the last 10 years. So we're about 200 people strong. And big, uh, we, we probably have the biggest backlog we've ever had. Uh, we're getting ready to do the biggest job we've ever done at BAE, and Brian will touch that job. Uh, retubing a main condenser on a uh, on an L deck, which is a very large piece of equipment, thousands of tubes, and that's never been done before in a shipyard. So um, uh, it's pretty exciting, and it's getting ready to start here beginning of next year. So John and his team are out looking for uh, folks as we speak, all different trades. Um, you know, probably at least uh, could be upwards of maybe a hundred people, depending on the other work we get. So we're we're hiring. No pressure, Brian. If you ever want to do another one, no pressure. <laughs> another what? Another another one of these big evaporators. No pressure. It's your yeah, first one. I, I Don't, no, no pressure, bud. No pressure. Excitement. <laughs> uh, I actually got a question for John. So people don't make the same mistake I did coming in trade you don't like. If you're entry level, is there a way to bounce around from trade to trade to figure out which one you're most interested in? It's a good question. I like that. Um, you know, in a perfect world, yes. Um, I would say that uh, you know it, it really depends on the different jobs and the needs that we have. Certainly, if if, if we uh, we can do that. We have done that. Um, I wouldn't say that we've let them touch every trade, but we brought folks in that, let's say, want to be a welder, but um, maybe we, we, we needed them later. So we put them to work in the electric shop and let them work there for a little while. Um, and we, we've done that before. And we've done that also with uh, some folks in the apprenticeship program as well. Let them, uh, you know, sort of touch each department and let them, you know, sort of get an idea of what they do. Uh, so that we 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 can accommodate that in in, in some sense, on occasion. Yeah, that's what I was thinking more along the apprenticeship lines. Just yeah, the younger guy come in and not know what you want to do, you get stuck in a certain trade. So the interesting thing about our apprenticeship program is it's 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 very directed. So it you have to choose a trade. So whether you're a welder or an electrician. So in addition to the schooling, you also have to get the hands-on training. Uh, that the supervisor has to sign off on the on the hours of, of OJT that you've had while you're in the program. So in in that case, I mean, our apprenticeship programs are are trade specific. Now, does that continue? Y'all have a continuing education? So, like Nick, that you know knows all this geometry. Ooh, Nick, uh, <laughs> is, there, is there like more math classes you make this guy take, or uh, is there is there more classes that you have to take, Nick, uh, going going uh, forward? Uh, no. Uh, when I that you could, stuff, how about that you can take, that they'll I pay for take, it? Yeah, there's always more classes I can take. And will uh, they pay for it? Yes, they will. There you go. Uh, as long as it's helping the company, they will. Yeah. Very nice. Well, you guys, you guys, I'd say what I learned a lot tonight just listening to you guys. This was an interesting, uh, I was a little bit more quiet than usual because I was enjoying just learning about it. This is something that I don't know anything about. So, uh, I want to personally thank all of you for coming on here and you all have the P word. You all have the passion for your jobs. And that's what we always like seeing. And if there's anybody out there watching this and you want to know more about it, of course, you can always give us a note there on the page. Uh, I think they're in the hub, Virginia, Virginia beach, Hampton roads, whatever that area, Chesapeake, Virginia is the hub of shipbuilding. And this is a, this is not only a great trade to be in, but it's also a portable trade, whereas you could go to other parts of the country or even the world and, and do and do what these jobs are. So I want to thank all of you for coming on here and uh, giving you all all that, giving us all that knowledge. Really appreciate it. Well, well said, Dave. We missed you last week and the week before. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you back, Dave.
Thanks, Joe. I, I, I sure appreciate tonight's show. I mean, it, it really takes me uh, back to some times in my life you know, being involved with uh, ship repair. Uh, and it was, it was challenging times. And so you guys are existing in that, that uh, uh, period of you know, constant work to improve uh, and keep our ships functioning the way that they need to in order to protect the country uh, and and serve around the world. So um, my hat is off to all of you guys. Thank you so much for being on the show. This was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. And follow that up. Again, I'm a big, big trades fan. That's, that's what I do. It's what I've always done. Um, tonight was one of the easiest shows. All y'all did a great job. Uh, Ken, um, how easy was this? Chuck says, I got a guy. Ken says, I got four guys. Like, we have, this is the easiest, <laughs> easiest show we've ever done as far as finding people because we always have bailouts and this and that. So, Ken, thank you for uh, getting these guys together, man. Uh, great, great group you got here. Um, they represented Hampton, uh, your auxiliary systems, Inc. Excellent. Uh, you guys are doing great things over there. Super proud. Um, with that said, it is 901. See y'all next week. Blue Collar Great Pockets. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Night. Thank you. Night.